Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Today we honor our Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, 1776. What an exciting day to have on a Sunday. Amen. And I get the blessing of being able to share my heart with you today. So thank you to Pastor Ryan, who's on vacation. Hopefully he's doing you know, well and they're resting. So I wanted to be able to recognize some people in the room. So if you are active duty military, any of the branches, could you please stand? Second group, st keep standing. The second group is any veteran that has ever served in any armed forces in your life. Could you please stand? <laughs> Amen. Now keep standing. Because there's one other group I was told at 9 o'clock that was kind of missing, and it is any spouse of someone who's a veteran or active duty. Could you please stand? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Who are you? On this 4th of July, i got to tell you who I am. I am a brother, and I am a son. I am a spouse that serves my wife. I am a stepdad serving my kids and grandkids. I am a pastor serving my church and community. I am a veteran of the United States Air Force, serving in the 436th. serving in the 436th Organizational Maintenance Squadron, Dover Air Force Base. I'm an American serving my country. But above all, let us not forget, I am a Christian, a child of God, serving my God. Amen. We're a lot in this world. Your resume can be really great, but there's one thing that is above anything in this world, and that is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because without God, we would have none of it. There would be nothing else. And so I want us to understand that the reality is simply this. On this 4th of July, remember this, that God is the creator, and we are his creation. God's way completely outdoes our way. Our wealth can't compare to God's riches and provision. God is wiser than any person could ever be on the face of the earth. God holds the future better than anyone can worry about it. Any kingdom we build is dwarfed by God's kingdom that is eternal and everlasting. God's word is greater than any of our agendas or philosophies on the face of the earth. But I want you to understand this also. God is greater than any political party or a governmental system on the face of this planet. God is, I'm going to get in trouble with this one. God is neither Republican, Democrat, or Independent. He is the Almighty God, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. And we submit to Him and Him only. You see, our freedom and purpose in our country as we celebrate it today was authored by God who worked through our founding fathers. I love the Word of God. I love studying the Word of God, but there's one other thing I love studying a lot, and that's American history. I think everybody should know where we came from. And one of the, my favorite things to read is about the American Revolutionary War. 
and I don't know if when you read it, there were many miracles that happened. Like only the hand of God could be with this ragtag army that was against a powerful and established foe. Consider this. It was in 17, November of 1775. A 25-year-old Continental Army colonel named Henry Knox was talking to George Washington, and they were in Boston, George Washington. The British had occupied Boston at this particular time, and they kept trying to attack George's army. And they didn't have a whole lot of armament, and they didn't know what they were going to do. And so they hatched this plan. And the plan is, hey, we had just a few months earlier taken Fort Ticonderoga in upper state New York. Anybody from New York in the upper state there in Fort Ticonderoga? And they took all of their mortars, their cannons, their howitzers, every bit of them. And they said, you know what? We can get them to Boston. And so that's what they decided to do. And so what they did is they took 60 tons of cannons, mortars, and howitzers including several 24-pound cannons known as Big Berthas, which were 11 feet long and weighed 5,000 pounds. And they took that from Fort Ticonderoga at the north end of Lake George to Boston, Massachusetts, which I don't know if you know that, but there were no roads and, and transportation systems and all of this other stuff. So they had to go over lakes and through rivers and swamps. And, and by the way, this was in November to January. They had to go through the Berkshire Mountains, and they did it all in 56 days. 60 tons of cannons, 60 tons of armament that they could use to fight the British in Boston, and they did it 300 miles in just 56 days. Historian Victor Brooks called it one of the most stupendous feats of logistics of the entire Revolutionary War. And there's story after story when you read about the Revolutionary War. It is only God that could help them do some of the things that they did. And Henry Knox himself said it was because of the providence of God that they were able to get this heavy equipment 300 miles across the country. Wow. I'm exhausted just talking about it. But they used that armament to defeat the British and get them out of Boston. And there was, a one, there was one story when the British were about to attack George Washington's army in Boston, and they were getting ready to make the attack, and this violent, heavy snowstorm hit. It's almost as if the hand of God came down and said, nope, you're not going to come against my people. That's what we're talking about. Our nation birthed in a miracle through a ragtag army. And when we look at the Founding Fathers, there are several things that they have said about the founding of our country. John Adams in 1813 said this to Thomas Jefferson. He said, the general principles of which the fathers achieved independence was the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are the eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. John Hancock said, resistance to tyranny becomes the Christian and social duty of each individual. Continue steadfast and with a proper sense of your dependence on God. Notably, defend those rights which heaven gave and no man ought to take from us. Samuel Adams, religion and good morals are the only solid foundation of public liberty and happiness. Benjamin Franklin said, freedom is not a gift bestowed upon us by other men, but a right that belongs to us by the laws of God and nature. And George Washington says, whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. George Washington also said, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. Amen. Ronald Reagan summed it up when he said this, the founding fathers believed that faith in God was the key to our being a good people and America's becoming a great nation. 
Folks, I gotta tell you something. And I know there are many people that are online right now just watching this, but I wanna proclaim something to you today. There are some people that would want us to believe that we are not a good nation because there was slavery and there were things that were happening in our country that were not good. But I would submit to us that nobody is perfect. That we, as a human being, are not perfect. And that our nation may have flaws and our nation may have difficulties and we may go in the wrong direction, but I'm here to tell you in the immortal words of Jesus Christ, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. Yes. We have erred, we have made mistakes, we have hurt people. But if we come back to the Lord and we worship him and we honor him, we can get his forgiveness and our humility will deliver our nation. Amen. What does God say? I gotta give you a few scriptures here. In Proverbs 14, 34, it says, righteousness exalts a nation but sin condemns any people. In the New Living Translation, it says, godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. The Amplified uses the word righteousness to mean moral and spiritual integrity and virtuous character. Proverbs 28.2 in the New Living Translation says, when there is moral rot within a nation, its government topples easily but wise and knowledgeable leaders bring stability. In the NIV, it says, when a country is rebellious, it has many rulers, but a ruler with discernment and knowledge maintains order. God's got some wisdom. In Proverbs 29, 2, in the New Living Translation, it says, when the godly are in authority, the people rejoice, but when the wicked are in power, they groan. In the NIV, it says, when the righteous triumph, there is great elation, but when the wicked rise to power, people go into hiding. And the Amplified says, when the righteous are in authority and become great, the people rejoice, but when the wicked man rules, the people groan and sigh. And finally, Psalms 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation. The New Living Translation says, what joy for the nation whose God is the Lord. It doesn't matter what nation you are. God is here to serve us all. And he wants us, he wants to be a part of all of our affairs. Do you remember the time where he was the king of his people, Israel, and all of a sudden in Samuel's day, he, they asked for a king. And that kind of saddened God a little bit. He says, I want to be your king. But this is what a king will do. And he let them have it. But I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter who rules. It means that just says God wants to be a part of our daily affairs. What is greater than our nation but the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ and his word? The Amplified reads this, blessed, fortunate, prosperous, and favored by God is the nation whose God is the Lord. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, one of the greatest scriptures, and this one came out of the dedication of the temple. You remember De, uh, Solomon built the temple of God, and the glory of the Lord came down, and there was a great celebration, even to the point of offering a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. This was quite the party. It was huge. God in all his glory came down. They sacrificed for him. And then everybody just celebrated, and then they all went home. And God appeared to Solomon. And part of what he said was this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. He promised to do that. And he basically was saying, hey, I know that you guys may go in the wrong direction, but if you turn, I am there for you. 
And part of what he said in 2 Chronicles 7 is, but if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you and go off to serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land, which I will give them, and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. So what God is doing is he is simply saying... I am the God of the universe, and I want to be your leader. I want to be the one that leads and guides you into anything that you're going to lead and guide in this nation or any nation. And this did apply to the nation of Israel. But can we all say that God wants to be the the, the God of the United States of America? And that's what we celebrate today on the 4th of July. Not just our independence, but we celebrate the God who gave us that independence and who can give it to us again and again. Amen. So I want to shout two points from the rooftops. Sometimes I wish I could take these two points and and we really had fun with it at nine o'clock. But I would love every single person to hear what I'm about to say. Because I think it's the key to our success, the key to saving our nation. You know that there's much going on, right? Is anybody not familiar with what's happening in our world? Is anybody not familiar with what's happening in our country? But God is still the same God, right? So the first thing I want to shout from the rooftops and proclaim to us today simply is this. We have to be anchored to a single standard, which is his word. We have to be anchored to a single standard. You see, it is a standard that never changes. God's word, heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will endure forever. It will never pass away. And because it's a standard that never changes, it moors us to a God that never changes. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change like the shifting shadows. He is steady. But here's the problem. There are so many voices and philosophies and changing views and progressive thoughts and worldly ideas and personal agendas that are permeating our nation. And if we are not moored, folks, listen to me carefully. If you are not moored to a standard, anything can be a distraction for us and take us away from our devotion to God and his word. The only thing that I want to say here is do not let God's word be diluted by anything this world will present to you. But we stand on it, and we stand on the grace of Jesus Christ. We stand on what God means in our nation. We want to stand on one standard alone. Has anybody ever heard of the Overton window? There was very few people that were um, in the 9 o'clock. I don't even see any hands here. The Overton window was a concept uh, that was created by James Overton. And what he saw is, if you take a window, and just pretend that there's a window right here, okay? And in that window are basically policies that we will accept in our nation. It is what's acceptable, okay? And so what happens, though, is there are radical ideas that try to impinge on that window and tries to influence where we are going. And so what happens is eventually, if that happens enough, the window begins to shift. And now we are seeing things different than we ever saw in the 60s and 70s. Do you notice a shift that is happening in our nation? Even in the last 10 years, what we believe today and what we are tolerating today is much different than what we would have before. And what God is wanting us to do, we're far enough away from it. And in our own personal lives, it can happen the same way. You have your own Overton window. It should be moored to God's word. But what happens is we, something encroaches on it. The enemy is a good enemy. He will take and he will try to water down God's word. He will try to get you to compromise. And before long, what you have not believed before becomes real today. And that's what's happening. And it happens so subtly. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why it's so important to be moored to the word, a standard that we are never going to allow ourselves to waver by. I got to tell you this. I have yet to hear 
And, and, I, and I like watching the news because I like to see when God is going to come here soon, you know, when you take a look at what's going on. I always look at it from the biblical principles anyway. But it isn't it amazing that out of all of the ills that we are facing as a nation today, God is never mentioned as a solution? But I'm going to tell you something. God wants to be the solution to everything that we are facing in our nation today. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jesus, he wants to be in our lives. He wants to solve the problems that we are having and the unrest that is happening in our world and where we are going as a nation. What we stand on ultimately be, will be what guides us. So we've got to stand on the rock. You don't want to be on sand. You want to be on the rock, the holy scripture of God. Amen? So we have to be anchored to a single standard. But secondly, and more importantly, as we hold on to that standard, are you listening? Are you with me? We need to develop and maintain critical thinking. When we have that word as a standard, we have got to develop something in our brains that says, wait a minute, what am I hearing? We can't afford to believe everything we hear. We can't afford to live our lives by shifting standards. We are the church of Jesus Christ. He gave us a standard. We are not going to abandon that standard, and I am not going to abandon that in my nation here today. Don't believe everything that you hear, and that's what happens in our Overton shift. It's like all of a sudden, we're okay, and then we hear something from some news network or from social media or something that, well... Yeah, you, you're right. Yeah, why is that? And we believe in hook, line, and sinker. It is time that we stand on the word and we critically think about things we are asked to believe. Do not believe everything that comes out the news networks. Don't believe everything that comes in social media. And don't believe everything that Google says. Believe the word of God. Stand on that standard. I love this proverb 14, 15. It's not going to be on your screen. But listen to it carefully. In the New Living Translation, it simply says, only simpletons believe everything they are told. <laughs> I love that. The prudent carefully consider their steps. In the NIV, it reads this way. The simple believe anything. Are you, are you simple today? Let's not be simple. Let's be a little bit more complicated. Let's challenge the thoughts of this world. And let's put God at the forefront because we are believers in God's creation in this world. The NIV says, the simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. In the Amplified, it gets even more indicting. It says here, the naive or inexperienced person is easily misled and believes every word he hears. But the prudent man is discreet and astute and considers well where he is going. I love that verse. You know what prudent actually means because it's in three different uh, versions here? Prudent means crafty, shrewd, sensible. It means you are skeptical. You don't accept everything just because you hear it. Folks, do you remember Pastor Kuhn? He'd be up here a lot, and he would say, don't believe me, go check it out for yourself. It is dangerous when we hear things and we just take it in like it's gospel. I may get in trouble with this, but CNN, Fox, and MSNBC are not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
weigh everything that you hear because our nation is dependent on it. It is shifting. It is moving. It is moving radically. And we need to return back if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. We've got to believe that. He will forgive our sins and heal our lands. So what is critical thinking? Just a little definition of it. It is an analysis of facts to form a judgment. It is rational, skeptical, unbiased analysis or evaluation of factual evidence. Wow, unbiased, skeptical. It is disciplined thinking that is clear, rational, open-minded, and informed by evidence. In a believer's mindset, everything should be run through the filter of God's word. And why is this important? Why is this important to hold on to? Because simply this, our experience, our biases, our prejudices, our training, our influences tend to cause us to hold on to beliefs that may not line up to God's understanding. What you may hear that is shifting in our country today is not going to line up with God's word. And we cannot believe anything that we say that does not line up with God's word. Now, here's the problem. If you stand for it, guess what's going to happen to you? You'll probably be persecuted because you're not in step with the world and you're not in step with progressive thought and you're not in step with the things that are happening in our country. Come on, don't you know that everything shifts and changes? Don't you know that God changes and he accepts certain things in our lives? I am here to tell you the answer to that question is no. God does not change. His word does not change. And if it did, he would not be God. Let's not shift like the world shifts. Let's stand as the church of Jesus Christ who wants to stand on the truth of what God wants us to believe. Did you know that mistake was made? Do you remember way back when the Israelites were in Egypt and they were in bondage and, and they cried out and God brought Moses to the arena? I've shared this story. To me, it's one of the most powerful stories and the saddest stories of Scripture. And so God leads them out with power and anointing. He parted the Red Sea. Does anybody here know what that looks like? And to have his whole nation go through dry land, what he had to do to get there. And then he leads them through the wilderness and he even cared enough about them not to bring them a short route because the Philistines would probably defeat them. God knew what they were doing, what he was doing. And then he came to the promised land. They came to the promised land. A land that God was about to give them. He did not lead them for nothing. He brought them to a gift. He brought them to a land that they were going to prosper forever and ever. Come on, church. And then 12 spies went in the land. I figured one from each network. Okay, maybe not. Ten of them came back. They all came back and said, yeah, this land is really good. They brought back clusters of grapes. Do you, have you ever seen grapes that you had to carry on poles? Not the little ones you get at Walmart, you know, a little bundle here. These are grapes that you carry on poles. It was a land that was great. But ten of them said, I don't think we can conquer the people. And they took their cell phones and they put it on Facebook <laughs> and on Twitter. They spread the word. Now, you, don't, you know I'm joking, right? I don't think that would happen back then. But listen, the, the one thing that they did have is they were all close together. They were, they were together as a nation. And you know when you tell a story or you give a news report, it gets distorted by the time it gets to the third and fourth person. And you know what that concept is like, right? 
But here's the sad part. 10 spies, 10 people convinced the entire nation that it was not good to go into the promised land, that God himself had brought them to. They were absent the critical thinking that was needed. Nobody ever said, well, Joshua and Caleb did because they tried to correct it. There was two spies that actually said, no, we can do this. Our God can lead us through. But they listened to the 10. They failed to critically think things through. Folks, if God brings you somewhere, I think he wants us to occupy it. Amen? If he brought us to the United States of America on July 4th, 1776, and people fought for the freedom that we have today, I think God wants us to keep it and not to listen to the 10 spies. Wow. My message is simply this, just in summing. We've got to stand on a word. We've got to stand on God's word as our primary guide through, our, through, the next, through the last days, whatever is going to happen. And I'm not saying that all of a sudden we're going to become a godly nation, but we as a church have an obligation to pray that through and to live a righteous life and to be the type of people that will critically think things through and will not be tossed and, you know, all over the place by every wind of doctrine. I just want to close with this statement. On this 4th of July, we can celebrate America's independence, but also we need to celebrate our divine dependence on God. Amen? And folks, I believe we cannot separate these two concepts. We celebrate the independence of our nation, but we also celebrate our divine dependence on God. So when you celebrate today, please, please, please remember what happened in our nation to bring us the freedoms that we have. And remember that there is no enemy that is going to come against us that is greater than God himself. And we are on the right side. Amen? And we need to shine our light in the darkness and help others to see what we see, that America is great. We have made mistakes, very grave mistakes, but it's the grace of God that forgives us and puts us on the right path. Amen? Amen. I just want to read Psalm 33 as, as we close. This, is, this, to me, is like I read this when I was preparing this, and I said, wow, it almost sums up everything. It says, sing joyful to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Let all the earth, he says, revere him. All of the earth, all of the nations. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the, earth, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He forms the hearts of us all who considers everything they do. I love this here. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those whose hope is in his unfailing love 
to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him where our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Amen. Amen. Don't put your hope in this country. Don't put your hope in a news source. Don't put your hope in the economic system. Don't put your hope in any kind of political uh, viewpoint, but hope in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's all stand today. Hallelujah. Lord, we're just thankful for your word today. Lord, we're excited today to celebrate the 4th of July. We're accelerated, we're excited to celebrate our independence. But Lord, what we want to declare as a church today is our divine dependence on you. So as we celebrate, as we go forth, I just pray, Lord, that you would give us your strength. And Lord, I pray for our nation right now that, Lord, you would influence people. We pray for the leaders. We pray for all of those that are involved in making decisions. We want to come back to you. And as a church, we proclaim, Lord, as your people, we are going to humble ourselves and pray and seek your face so that you can hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our land. So, Lord, be with us this day. Protect us all as we celebrate, but let us never, never, ever, ever forget you. And that's the message today that you have for us. It is great to celebrate you in the midst of everything that we celebrate in this world. So we honor you today, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.